You don't want to be on this with your bathing suit, do you? Sure, I don't care. Fucking hell. <laughs> I don't know, babe. This this one shitty setup here. Oh, you're gonna be in so fuck. Oh yeah, I'm serious. I'm serious. My gosh, my piece God. of. Sh this is the lens for July 2021. Now I'm recording. Am I recording? Good. And we've gone video. We're no longer just an audio podcast, so I gotta go sit out in nature somewhere, or out in the environment. This is more or less my neighborhood. Welcome to it. It's a little bit kind of urban, suburban. My guest today is Sturgios Scatharudis. He is a therapist out in uh, Rochester. Uh, he just went on a vision quest. So I'm learning a lot from him about alternative forms of asceticism, uh, all different manner of deprivation that uh, produces altered states of consciousness and awareness. Just finished a retreat a couple weeks ago. If you're interested in getting in on some of our retreats, get in touch, put my contact info down there in the comments or on the notes for the show. Join us, uh, maybe you'll get to meet Sturgios. Uh, what else is new? Well, I started a private practice. You can find me on Psychology Today. All right, well, enough about me. Let's get into this interview with Sturgios. Enjoy. I'll see you on the other side. Sturgios Katarudis. Yes. How do I know you? Maybe you're a Greek in past life. <laughs> Right. How about in this life, though? How did I, how did we get together? I don't we know. We got together. Deborah, I uh, guess. Deborah, right? Deborah told me about you. Yeah. Um, told me. Didn't tell me about you. He told me about how she was doing, and mm -hmm. said, "Oh, I'm doing this and that, and we really, um, you know." I said, "How how do you get involved?" And he said. Well, this guy, Dennis, <laughs> you know, you should connect with him. And, oh, by the way, there's a meeting uh, in that cafe. I don't remember which cafe it was. Oh, yeah, Underground's. Oh, no, or the, uh, let's see, Dog Ears Books and Cafe. Yeah. Yes, yes, on the second, right, on the mm -hmm. second floor. And I said, you know, I might come. And um, I was curious enough, and um, I came, and that's how you and I met. So since then, I, I've had some great conversations with you about your, about your youth mm -hmm. and interesting events that happened in your, in, your, in your youth, like your childhood, but not a lot, but enough to just really whet my appetite, like, ooh, i got to find out more about this. So, <laughs> I mean, so where were you born and, and who were you born into? What was that family like and composed of? Yeah, I was born in a small village in the northern part of Greece, about seven hours north from Athens. Mm. Uh, if you go one hour north, you will find yourself in um, uh, in Bulgaria, oh, okay. a different country. So I'm I'm up there. Um, yeah, I born with uh, in a family of farmers, tobacco farmers. Tobacco farmers. They grew farm. tobacco and wheat. Uh, and wheat. You make bread, not wheat, wheat. Yeah. Wheat that you make bread. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, a very poor family, uneducated. I think my father finished first grade, second grade. My mother pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. uh, so I grew up in a you know, in a, in a kind of humble family. Uh, probably the village had like 100, 150 people all together. What was the name of the village? Zervahori. Zervahori? Z. Zervahori. Which means... Hori means small town. Zerv, Zerv means left. Left. In left town. Town left. <laughs> <laughs> the town left out? <laughs> 
left behind. <laughs> left behind. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Did that sense of being left behind permeate the uh, attitude of the citizens? Like here in Buffalo, there's a collective, uh, almost an insecurity. Uh, no, there's a, a collective uh, inferiority complex because we keep losing championships even though we go and we get snowed on in amounts that are uh, just soul crushing. Hmm. You know, we had these blizzards that we're famous for, so people just sort of dismiss us. But we have these delicious chicken wings that right. have, I guess, in some sense, maybe redeemed us <laughs> in, in the right. collective conscious. But um, there's a sense of, like, there's a psychology that seems to prevail here because hmm. of that. But was that, so in the town that was left out, what was the is there a collective psychology there that you recall um i think family maybe mm -hmm. uh family is that something because people depend on each other they borrow each other's tools they borrow each other's horses mm -hmm. to go to the fields mm -hmm. so there was kind of some kind of although it's a village it's a town people are bartering around and surviving. So when you were farming, it was not with uh, machinery? It was the, with horses and stuff? For the most part, it was with cows and horses. Wow. Yeah, cows and horses. Uh, or uh, mules, because mm -hmm. mules are very strong. The few people who got lucky to have machinery, uh, you can rent them out. Yeah. If you had the money to rent mm -hmm. them out and do your plot of tobacco, usually mostly not tobacco, it mostly was uh, weed. Mm -hmm. Like they would have this machinery. There. But a lot of people did not have that. Mm -hmm. So they would um, plow and, and reap uh, by hand. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Now did that, so then do you have a lot of facility and capacity with uh, animals and I personally didn't see this because I was too young, mm -hmm. but I remember, I recall my, uh, my uncle, my aunts, ah. waking up three in the morning. So you weren't brought up in the farming? I really didn't, brought, I, I lived with it, but I mm -hmm. didn't, I never was involved with farming, I, wow. but I saw it uh, for a few years until we moved to a bigger city. We moved gotcha. to Thessaloniki, which is the so largest city after Athens. So then your folks got out of the farming business? Got out of the farming business quick. Um, and they, um, they went to, to Thessaloniki, which is a big ah, city. And, Thessaloniki. Uh, Thessaloniki, yeah. Where we get Thessalonica f in the Bible from, in the Correct. Book of Thessalonians, where, right? Correct. Right, that's where you got it from, New, the New Testament. So that's not an abstract place for you. That's no. Like, like I grew up there yeah. in Thessaloniki, outside of Thessaloniki, about nine, ten miles. And, uh, and yeah, I grew up there from five up to twelve. Yeah. So what were you into? Uh, well, my parents got divorced and it was like... Then I was put into a special school. That's where I went to Thessaloniki. You know, like a boarding school? Boarding or? school, oh, yeah. Boarding so you lived apart from your Correct. family. How old were you when that started? Five and a half, six. Oh, my gosh. Very young, yeah, yeah. So I, I grew up with um, parents being absent in a way. Wow. And I, what was that like? Who? Quite an experience. Yeah? Very, uh, um, very, you can, I mean, it's an abandonment, right? I mean... Um, so I have, I grew up with abandonment issues, right? With a what? Abandonment. Oh, been, abandonment been, issues. Right. Ab yeah, big yeah. time. And um, so I, uh, I grew up with that. I uh, eventually I reunited with my parents, but not, not until I was 16. Okay. 16, 17. Wow. So 10 years. 10, 11 years I was that away was from it. Yeah. A decade of your childhood. Right. Who was in that role? 
of parent during uh, that decade? The authorities in the school, like, who Crazy. are like, in, basically it was an institution, really, mm -hmm. you know, like, and um, so we would go to school there, eat there, there's structure there. How common was that for, for children? Not, not very common. What, what was the factor that made people say, well, let's give this guy this unusual upbringing? You know, I, as I said, my parents didn't really, were not educated. Or, mm -hmm. you know, first, second grade, um, they didn't like each other, mm -hmm. getting married, you know. I think they got married um, because it was uh, a convenience. They were both in the same village. Mm -hmm. And back then, the marriages were happening to that extent. Hey, you have a daughter, I have a son, mm -hmm. I can give you a cow. I can give you some money. Mm -hmm. Can we make? Can we bring this all together? And that's how your so, folks got together. Yeah, my dad yeah. got a cow and some cash. Mm -hmm. and he married my mom. <laughs> Good deal. <laughs> Good deal. A cow and some cash. <laughs> it sounds very foreign, but it's so true. That's that's really. And how many brothers and sisters did you have? I have uh, one step brother, yeah. uh, about ten years younger than me. He lives back home. And, but as you uh, were growing up, you were the only kid? Yeah, yeah, I was uh, the only kid. Um, I didn't, I don't know my stepbrother because we live separately. And he had his life, I have his life. I met him two, three times. I mean, so was there some sort of pressure on your parents, like, financially or something that they, or, or that they were inept or incompetent to raise you and just, like, what went into that decision? Yeah, um, I think they never really liked each other mm -hmm. to begin with. And I think my mom got pregnant before they got married. Mm -hmm. So they got their, they speeded up to get married before they had me. Gotcha. Because of shame, guilt of being like out of mm -hmm. wedlock yeah. and being 150 people in the village. Yeah, it's pretty shameful. I mean, you think, you think. What's funny is that same, that same force of civilization there, right, was an operation in my life because I got a woman pregnant when I was twenty-five, mm. and my sphere of about one hundred and fifty people, family, um, church members, yeah. and stuff, all agreed like. That's no good. You got to marry the. You right. got to do the right thing, mm -hmm. and we got married. Mm -hmm. it, it went pretty good for fifteen years, but <laughs> you 15 know years, we yeah. got the kid up and and out. But so so things started to deteriorate f with them by the time you were five or six. Even before that, okay. Before it was a question for them if mm, my dad did not want that. He wanted to abortion or whatever. He said, you know, gotcha. Uh, uh, but, you know, uh, it didn't happen, and uh, there was friction mm -hmm. about what they would do with me now, she got pregnant. Wow. Do we keep him, or do we really... So there was already turmoil. It sounds almost like going to boarding school was like a delayed adoption proceeding, or a delayed orphanage placement. Yeah, you can call it orphanage, actually, orphanage. Yeah. I remember we used to wear... Um, same clothes. I think we're like 240 kids. 240 kids. Like a uniform? Uniform, right. Yeah. And I remember I had a number on my, un my clothes, all my clothes, because there were so many kids and we belonged to a certain building. Building one to 10. I belong building seven, 24 kids. And we have, used to have rooms where I slept with two other kids in the same room. Wow. One bed here, one bed there. One bed there, and uh, so the clause would not be lost. They assign us number, ah. numbers. Wow. Seven, building seven, thirteen. So it was your seven thirteen. My, my seven thirteen, building that seven thirteen. That's the kid. That's me. That's almost like concentration comes. My number is wow. seven thirteen. What a perfect uh, dichotomy of number. I mean, you've got the luckiest number, everyone agrees, is seven. 
And the unluckiest number when Absolutely. everyone agrees is 13. Like yin yang, right? <laughs> I mean, if it, if it had been in another setting, say like Hogwarts, you know, you would have guys have gotten been creative and called your building like, you know, right. Huff and Puff or whatever they, <laughs> I, I, didn't, I did not read those books. What's striking me is so one of the things I think about a lot that I really have, this will be the first time I've had a chance to talk to somebody who's, who's experienced it, but the, the phenomenon of an unwanted child. Mm. Okay, so the phenomena, the fact that that exists in the world. Yeah. And I've been trying to, you know, I really like to boil down extremes. Like, what's the, mo what's the ultimate evil? What's the ultimate um, good? What, like, mm -hmm. trying to imagine, like, just the heaven and hell of existence. And, w you know, this, this year's been a, an amazing year of thinking about w what's the ultimate in racial injustice, for example, mm -hmm. and really trying to boil down the flavors of misery and unhappiness that can be experienced in a life, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the phenomenon of the unwanted child, okay, right. and, and, the, and the ripple effect mm -hmm. of that and all the data and measurable statistics mm -hmm. that you can trace back to this phenomenon this moment in time in which someone had a child that they did not want right um so it's something you could look at from the outside and mm -hmm. and analyze but what's what's happening on the inside of that i guess i, I think unwanted is a good word mm -hmm. right um not belonging, mm -hmm. not sure where you belong, or mm -hmm. to what you belong, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, um, you know, it's hard to describe that experience because it's not intellectual, it's visceral. Right? So it was experience? Yeah, it's a visceral experience of being left behind, mm -hmm. right? or of being put away, mm -hmm. um, or being, like, outcasted. Right. Right? Outcasted. And not only outcasted, but you're outcasted in such a way that it was visually known that you were outcasted because the orphanage had um, ten foot fences all around it. And he had a big gate, double metal gate, like cast iron it's gate. It's just concentration camp. Yeah. So it was visually prison. Right. Visually, uh, it's similar to, uh, yeah, a prison. Um, mm -hmm. And you had a number. <laughs> yeah. And you wear the same clothes, mm -hmm. same color, yeah, same always shorts, rubber boots, winter, summer. Uh, so you're really, I feel like I'm molded into East, I mean, East, East, East to symbolize. Institutionalized. Institutionalized, yeah. And it's such a young age, it leaves you, you cannot, I, I couldn't describe it back then, but it leaves you, and you go out to the village and people are looking at you. And When's that happening? Like, is that a daily occurrence? Or no daily occurrence was uh, going to church, mm -hmm. 240 kids, <laughs> Sunday morning walking down to the church, and uh, mm -hmm. or... Um, so it was very restrictive where we would go out, but we were kids, and sometimes I would escape, and I'd go and do this, do that, you know. But the look of the people looking at you, they knew you belong mm -hmm. to that yeah. place, right? So yeah. that was kind of... I picked a lot of shame from that because I didn't want to be spotted out, but I was mm -hmm. spotted out. And also by our hair. We used, mm -hmm. They used to cut our hair. Like yeah. uh, with clippers, totally clippers. Yeah. Right? So I were f visually was recognized. Oh, what's out? That kid is from the orphanage. Be careful. Uh, yeah. You know, poor thing. And kind of yeah. like you're feeling the. The pity. The pity of others, like poor thing, kind of. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. The sense of identity, were, was there individualism within that uniformity? Did you experience individualism, or did you have a sense of a collective 
sense of your identity. Mostly collective. Yeah, what's that like? Because that's so foreign yeah. to somebody who grew up in America. There's unless they're part of a big family, maybe. Yeah, uh, the feeling of the free will, the free. Uh, I mean, what I like, what I didn't like, what uh, choices, uh, freedom were all controlled by others. Mm-hmm. So the sense of you, you belong to the state. You don't belong to you. You belong mm-hmm. to us, and we will tell you what's right and the way to go. So when it was like not developing a sense of self, but developing what was given to me through through the group uh, mm-hmm. by an employee of the state. Let's say an employee of the state would decide: you wake up this time, you go to school this time, you sleep this time. Uh, you eat this time, mm-hmm. and you go to church that time. And you have a little bit of playtime between. Was there a hierarchy within the, the, the children themselves that you felt a, akin to, or a family within that? Or was that just stark and brutal as well? The, uh, what? Yeah, uh, I think uh, the... the Hierarchy was coming from the authorities there mm-hmm. who got paid to watch us. There like, wasn't anything organic, to use that word again, yeah, like uh, happening within the ranks of the kids? Or like, was no one sort of emerging as uh, the ringleader or the shot yeah. caller? Or? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, we had a group with friends for five, for five of us where we really... You had a five-person yeah. unit? Right, cool. and, and uh, we... Who escape from the orphanage, go adventures <laughs> to the Thessaloniki, bringing like puppies back. Uh, we found somewhere, and we you you got know, dogs into the dog. Yeah. But they, they, you know, they killed it. Or uh, we oh. did, we did what kids do. Mm-hmm. But also, always with the thought of ten out we might be caught, and if we get caught, mm-hmm. we're gonna get hit. Not being a timeout, but actually physically get. Yeah, yeah. Beat with, with a, uh, with stick or with a hand, yeah. or with, yeah. So yeah. it was always a threat, but the the threat of being caught, but the adventure of a child overcomes that. Yeah. Say, so I take my chances. <laughs> Any adventures em- emerging in your uh, awareness right now that you just? Yeah, I think yeah. a lot of it. I said one was the, the dogs. Uh, another adventure was during Christmas, uh, the holidays, uh, we would go and say carols, sing carols. Mm-hmm. Uh, not only in the village, but we actually would walk 10 miles, 11 miles to go to the big city, Thessaloniki. Mm. And we were like, you know, uh, as a group, we would sing the carols, not to make money. They have to, or to get like nuts or stuff like that. So we we made money by singing carol. So during holidays was a big one for us uh, because we say, oh, time to work. <laughs> <laughs> time to make money. Make hay right. when the sun shines. Right, right, right. Uh, so, um, and then you guys would just walk. We would walk. Uh, and would we'd, that be that 240 kids or, or like the well, f- no, more like just the five, five unit? Five of us. Oh it was my gosh. Individually, like our group, you know, we yeah. got, you know, and you, you know, um, developing, I think, friends and a core group yeah. it was a life saving experience. In terms of social engagement, if I think. If I didn't have the social engagement with other kids, that yeah. where I felt I belonged, yeah. I would probably develop some uh, um, severe mental illness. Right. Yeah. 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 What's going on with those guys? You know, it's interesting. Um, I was talking to someone a couple of years ago uh, on uh, Facebook. Mm-hmm. And... Um, it's very sad. It makes me feel sad that, well, I'm divorced. Mm-hmm. My friend was divorced. Two brothers, twin brothers, that was in our group, mm-hmm. 
never got married. Mm -hmm. And they lived to, They used to live together when I remember them after we got out of the orphanage. Mm -hmm. And they live together today after mm -hmm. so many years. And to me that brings like, my God, mm -hmm. that brings tears to my eyes that mm -hmm. how we're conditioned Mm. The primary, the primal years of our lives, where you develop a self, you develop identity, you have wishes, you have wants, you explore. We're so constricted mm -hmm. that some of us, like those two, Michalis, Michael, and Costas, I remember mm -hmm. their names because, uh, and they never. They just became single men, mm -hmm. brothers and sisters who live all their life together. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's like, that brings tears. Yeah. Brings sadness. I guess you're probably then remembering them as they were when you were kids, and they, they seem to hold a far greater potential than the solitude. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they... Uh, it's just the fact that not to have a partner, not to, not to grow, not to socially engage. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that picture in my mind that, ah, oh, it mm -hmm. hurts. It hurts. Uh, and I know the severity of, um, of being institut institutionalized. I, uh, some people are in jail. Some mm -hmm. people have already died. Uh, there's that deep, deep kind of sense of um, put away, you know, and now you come right. into the world and, and try to make life out of you know, it's, it's, it's hard to, to get going. Yeah, and that's part of, I mean, there's that, there's that um, <clears throat> you could trace that back to the institutionalization, some of those phenomena and then there's that other thing of not being wanted, right? Because that's probably their story as well. Sure, to some sure. extent. You know, it's interesting you say that because those particular two brothers actually they felt that's the best thing that happened to them. They got they felt lucky because their uh, their mom got killed. Their father had died before, and they had an aunt uh, where she could not care for them. So they said, "Good thing was this place there." For me, mm -hmm. it was totally different. My experience was. I'm not wanted. Yeah. I was left there. Uh, why am I in an orphanage? I have a mom and dad that are alive. Yeah. Very confusing. If they're alive, why why they call me an, orf an orphan? I don't right. get it. What, what's wrong with that? Yeah. And the way I was left in the orphanage was not in a way that was appropriate. Like nobody told me I was going there. Wow. They told me I was going for for a walk where I would see other kids there, I would like them, I would play soccer ball, I would do this, and I was excited. And, uh, and uh, what happened, my, uh, I went with my dad. Mm -hmm. My mom left us, so mm -hmm. my dad tried to keep me, but he couldn't, he was working. So he brought me to this orphanage, and in an appropriate time, mm -hmm. he left. And when I turned around, she wasn't there. So to me, so no goodbye. To to me, that that was the the visceral abandonment of really. He's here, and now it's not. So so, so that, that was unique amongst that community of kids because not all of them experienced that sensation of unwantedness. They they might have experienced loss, betrayal. Betrayal, betrayal for you, betrayal. Right, because my parents, my my father was to me represented God. Mm -hmm. So I lost my God in a way. I lost yeah. everything. Dropped. That's his job, right? Right. I mean, I, you know, kids always look up to them. At least I did. Yeah. Uh, and your dad drops you without saying goodbye or without telling you the truth. What, what is this? What are you doing? And then but, for those ten years. No contact? Or was there any checking in? Or? Uh, contact was very spare. Maybe out of 10 years, maybe four or five times. I mean, that years. first gap, was there, what was your, do you have a rec recollection of the first time that you s saw him after the abandonment? 
uh, well, it was first of all, it's a shock to the system, to my system. Like, my system got shocked. Like, mm-hmm. if they put you, like, to hold two electrical things yeah. and you get it. It was that. And then I think I developed clinical depression. Oh. Uh, they call it anaclytic depression mm-hmm. uh, in clinical terms, where actually my body shut down. Mm-hmm. And how my body shut down was I couldn't eat. I would pee in my mm. bed. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would see nightmares. Um, I, I dropped a lot of weight. Like mm-hmm. uh, I was hospitalized to gain some weight because, but I didn't have appetite for, for months and months. So I was, the first, I'd say the first year I was under kind of, The authorities are worrying that mm-hmm. something seriously going on with me. Uh, 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 eventually, um, I adjusted, believe it or not. Mm. Uh, not adjusted the loss, but adjusted... Somehow my body made up, or ever needed to make it up. It was not intellectual or talking totally involuntary on your part right just some resilience that was resilience and, right. and emerged yeah on its almost own. like my spirit went into hiding mm. almost like once that happened it's like whoosh, i checked out and dissociated because i needed to the um, staying really staying sane <laughs> and not dissociate and our Brains have the capacity to dis- dissociate yeah. when we're really not able to handle what's happening at that time. And good thing it does because it saves lives. Okay? Right. So, yeah, it's, it's a, so powerf- diso- a powerful survival yeah, aid. Absolutely. The, the, the brain d- does it. You know, I didn't know at age five, five and a half, how mm-hmm. to do that. Mm-hmm. I don't need it now. My brain did it, my yeah. body did it. At a cost. Which yeah, like shutting down everything, mm-hmm. um, hospitalized, losing weight, uh, nightmares. Uh, so all those the body re- releases in order for me to stay alive in a way. Mm-hmm. And it did, it did. At a cost, right? Uh, well, I mean, I'm a therapist today because mm-hmm. I try to find what's happened to me. That's right the on. reason I... Yeah. And also it's my gift as a therapist. I think people who have experienced, and I hear stories from other people who are counselors who about their childhood life uh, mm-hmm. it's a gift and a course at the same time course in terms of wow kids should have their parents right all the mm-hmm. time right? but it didn't happen in my case mm-hmm. but what that develop is develop other qualities we were talking about today at the meeting mm-hmm. of there is gains in the loss what are the gains, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's an opportunity in the last. And what's the opportunity? Right? And, yeah. and uh, all that. So, so I'm, uh, I'm from that contrast. A lot of loss, a lot of grief in uh, feeling not wanted. And even today, it's hard for me to get with people. Like, I, even with my ex-wife, I didn't feel I belong. The belonging part. It's huge. Wow. Of being, or of being wounded, mm-hmm. or being part of this thing. Mm-hmm. So a lot of my life it was not trusting. Mm-hmm. Not trusting, absolutely. Uh, always having a door to jolt out. Get ready. Right. Yeah. You won't leave me. I will leave you. Mm-hmm. And I know when the time is right. I'll sit over here next to the door. Yeah, next yeah. to the door. Yeah, <laughs> you make any move, I'm out. <laughs> so it's yeah. it's unconscious mm-hmm. part of my life. And um, I did work. I did therapy. I, I involved with men's group where we talk about trauma and healing and mm-hmm. and I did retreats I did a lot of stuff to, f- to find out man but that feeling of not belonging mm-hmm. is a companion mm-hmm. can, I cannot really say it's over 
Because mm -hmm. once it happens and it's an experience, it becomes part of the whole. The belonging. Yeah, of not belonging. It's always with me. Now. Oh, the sensation of not belonging not belo is all, something you carry it all I the time. I carry it because mm -hmm. it's an experience. I cannot get rid of experiences. Yeah. But I can hold them and find other tools to help me feeling less, not wounded. Not 100%, my baby, 30%. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess it's not surprising then that there are experiences which you do seek out which would overwhelm the system. that circuitry. Absolutely. It would overwhelm it with belonging. Absolutely. Oh, right, man. right, right, right. We were talking about the Sundance the sun event, that, and it's yeah. just so very exclusive and rigor and and, and and demanding. And rigorous, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a physical thing. I mean, people people have died oh. in Sundance. And like, the brotherhood that comes from experiencing that, I must be yeah, a volcano. And, and it's not about it's not about like Sundance. It's not about me for me is mm -hmm. it's it's actually it's an intention and prayers for a cause like i can say i'm sacrificing and i'm dancing for all the children and adults who ever mm -hmm. have been institutional institutional Tell me, tell, institutionalized. I cannot say that word. Yeah, <laughs> institutionalized everywhere in the world. Everyone who went to jail, everyone yeah. who went to prison. Every, and it doesn't matter if it was deserved or not deserved. I don't see that. What I see is behind fences, behind bars. Yeah, just where you land. Whether it's small, adults, I, I send my prayers to those people. So it's a. It's a Okay, so that, that, that collective of children and, and adults who are institutionalized, it's a force greater than yourself. Yeah. And so, you, and so it, it has the capacity f to incorporate you and, and have you belong to them. I, I feel I belong, yeah. yeah. Uh, for the biggest part of my life, uh, I wanted to go to Romania or Russia or, and become a counselor Mm -hmm. to orphanages there mm -hmm. uh, because I have the felt sense mm -hmm. of what that feels like yeah yeah right I think I can be I belong to them in a way that's what I part of me says this is your job right this is you went through it yeah. you're not in jail you did something you you put yourself to college you you know, you went to graduate school, you did two degrees at the same time, you come to the other side, but the felt sense, it never <laughs> leaves you. It's, wow. it's, it's, a, it's a constant companion. Yeah. You can have the most beautiful person in your life. And still, that aloneness, that not belonging, mm -hmm. is a companion. Uh, it's not forgotten. It's part of my... Blood yeah. is part of my bones. It has settled. I see an image where, as you say that, a, 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 of a seed. Like there's a seed. You have a seed. It's there. It contains that, that seed of unwantedness, that seed of not belonging. It has not borne fruit. Somehow you, somehow you managed miraculously against, against your nature. To, to live a life that does not seemingly have evidence of unwantedness. Like you defied it, the unwanted, but the seed is there. Yes, it is. It yeah. could sprout. It could sprout, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, um, and I think part of it, how the unwantedness mm -hmm. is playing to my life in in not such a positive say, uh, ways is relationships. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can do, w alone, mm -hmm. I think I can do well. And people think I'm great and <laughs> wow. But 
going into a relationship, intimate relationship, mm -hmm. all the hell can get loose, right? There's the seed. Because there's where the seed gets planted is in yes. the, the intimate relationship. Right. That's when actually my fears, my anxieties, my insecurities mm -hmm. all come up. Wow. And and I can because that's a connection that someone can get be hurt here. Someone can be left behind. Mm. It's a possibility. So that's and maximum vulnerability. Yes. The you mentioned that the loss produces a gain. Yeah. It reminds me of when blind people or deaf people report that they're um, sensitivity and pow powers of location using sound, for example. Mm -hmm. um, if you're if you're blind, people actually have developed sonar. Yeah. Um, it's amazing. So there's these like superpowers mm -hmm. that are amplifications. Right. Um, what do you see? I mean, maybe you hinted at it with your therapeutic skill and craft, but where where is the gain concretely? How would you define the gain from your loss? Um, I think the gain is in having empathy, mm -hmm. com compassion, um, in terms of therapeutic ways, like so, okay. amplified compassion, amplified compassion, and and also really read people. I can uh, I feel like I um, I have a, like a felt sense of like I read the body well. Mm -hmm. I learned to read the body well to survive. Mm. So I can I read everything. Like I read I read the move of the hair. You know, mm -hmm. like I'm, I watch. I don't watch just. I just take it in kind of like that mm -hmm. that ability uh, everything moves or doesn't move I take it in uh, and that can be considered a gift yeah and also can consider I can because sometimes I'm wrong and my wrong you got to connect up, a lot of right, dots to right. do that my, my wrongness sometimes is because of my personal experience but um, but a lot of times I'm, I'm right there and I think it serves me well in therapy uh, uh, the counseling I do with people I can I can really uh, and I don't put it on them but we check it out what you know if that's true for them and most of the time it, something is there uh, but yeah empathy compassion um, and healing qualities I think healing qualities um, I mean I feel like a wounded healer in a way. Like you mm. know, you cannot be a healer from the books. You mm -hmm. have to have the visceral experience, something that mm -hmm. happens to you, to really come out of your body, not out of your mind, because I think the healing comes out of the body, wow. out of the organs. Like I think our organs, neurobiologically, mm -hmm. sense things, feel things, know things. Mm -hmm is one of our organs. And those as important is the brain itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, thinking that the brain is the boss, is the, to me, is the wrong approach. Mm -hmm. You're looking things from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. I look things from bottom up. Okay. Right? I understand that the neurons that comprise our brains are distributed. Right. And, right. and I, from what I understand, at greater number. Right. So right. it's the it's the lower half of the iceberg, really. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So then you're, this is a terrain having to heal from within. It's a terrain you have walked personally. You're familiar with the landscape of it. You're guiding somebody else. Maybe they're not placing their attention on these locations of right. Sense trauma sense. and, and uh, opportunities for healing, and you're able to point out the landscape for them. Absolutely. Because that's where healing is. Mm -hmm. We think a lot's here in the brain, in the mind. Mm -hmm. And it is. And it's here too. You know, yeah. the, the body keeps a score. Mm -hmm. You know, the body keeps uh, the burden. Or um, There are so many books written now. And yeah. we're really, I, I, I like to think therapy as neurobiologically based, not, not 
I mean, what happened to us, I feel, is, is part of our environment. It's not genetically. I think it's mm-hmm. epigenetically. Okay. You know, epigenetics, uh, not genetics. Gotcha. Uh, even in kids uh, who have ADHD, autistic, uh, uh, accepting that without further investigation of how it developed, yeah. I think we do misservice and push them medications. And yeah, now, any labeling just seems right. to short circuit right. the the journey. It short circuits the discovery process. Right, and and it's a you know it's a cop out as well. It's a mm-hmm. misservice, you know, like not looking uh, at depth uh, whether that condition or labeling the person has not not been curious more other than yeah yeah it fits right of the questionnaire the curiosity okay. mild autism yeah. uh, severe developmental or intellectual disability mm-hmm. and right medications for that or to me that's like the service you know you don't really respect the human being mm-hmm. you pass it on uh, for all I know it could be that but without exploring it you would never know. And unfortunately, look, Medicaid and all those things, mm-hmm. they want half an hour, examine it, label it, out of the door. And, yeah. you know, and what medications need that? And to me, that's like, that's like a disservice. And, mm-hmm. and not only disservice, but also, um, I would say, it's, um, it's um, um, uh, like doctors doing... Um, a surgery and really ruin the people like uh, I forgot how do you say that word uh, malpractice oh malpractice yeah. absolutely absolutely mm-hmm. a, a day would come where perhaps I would like to see a day where we would be judged by malpractice but not exploring the human being and yeah. uh, assigning labels only it's been very effective to this model of um, of uh, oh here's a here's an imbalance to your brain's chemistry, right? Um, that is the source of your misery, right? Yeah, now. and we can alleviate that by that. And it's been shown clinically that we, this will alleviate it. Um, and I imagine it's perpetuated to some extent because, to some extent, it's kind of working. Yes, <laughs> right, right. Somebody's like, "Yeah, Doc gave me that pill, and I'm kind of." A little flying a little straighter now. This is not too bad. Right, right. But, uh, but the bigger the, story is that their source. Right. There was. Uh, it's not just hardware. There was software running on that hardware that screwed up the hardware. Right. <laughs> well, they're, they're they're looking for symptoms and not the cause. Okay. Right. It's symptomatology based, not cost related, not root related. They're looking for symptoms, and they're describing what, how the symptoms can be reduced. Yeah. But at what cost? Like, what is the cost? Paying for the medications, perhaps side effects of the medications, perhaps uh, the person remains flat. Mm-hmm. Right? And do we want really people to remain flat? Yeah. Right? Like being like in a, in a machine. Yeah. It's similar to vegetable. Or we want to explore more. What is for them? You know, tell me, tell me about what an environment. I remember when I was going to school. It was we have the acronym P I E PI, mm. person in environment. Mm. Right? The environment. I feel the environment plays a lot. Yeah. Into how we become. It's a more complete picture Absolutely. of the total system. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, let's. I have two things to jump into to back up to. You mentioned that the superpower of being able to read mm-hmm. a person non-verbally. Mm-hmm. And I try to superimpose that over the challenges of an intimate relationship and thinking about is that a is that an advantage or a disadvantage? Mm-hmm. Is mm-hmm. the fact that you're able to absorb so much communication mm-hmm. without the other person having to utter a word 
right? It's almost as if it's uh, taken from them involuntarily. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit of a, of a violation there, right? Right. Well, voyeur, right? Voyeur is... <laughs> <laughs> so that fascinated me, and I thought, wow, okay. Ten years... But let's go back to this now. Let's go back to your timeline. Ten years goes by, and you're reunited with your family? Uh... So now you're 16? Yeah, uh, when I was 16, 16 and a half, mm-hmm. um, I remember my dad, by that time, he had remarried for the third time, uh, lived in Sweden, in the country of Scandinavia. And um, I remember telling him, look, <laughs> by that time, from five and a half to 12, I was in Thessaloniki. Mm-hmm. Then my time have ca- come to go to high school or a trade school. Mm-hmm. All my buddies were going to trade school. And mm-hmm. to me, who cares about high school? I go, I go with my buddies, wherever they go. Yeah. Right? So they, they, t- they took us to another orphanage in the island of Crete. Wow. Right? And Cretans. we stayed there five more years. So six years in Thessaloniki, five, five years in... Um, and, I, and I was there where uh, I told my, you know, my dad, look, um, over the phone, I'm done, how, I mean, I'm six, almost 17, what, what, what am I gonna do? You have to take me out of here now. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, it's been 11 years, I mean, he said, well, stay a little bit there more, you know. I said, what for? I said, I'm, 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 I'm grown up, you know, I'm not five years old, I'm, I'm 17. So his wife didn't warn me. Mm-hmm. She said, you know, um, you can stay there. Uh, I used to remember, I used to do collect calls. Uh, where, you know, we have the old system where you like, yep. you go to the phone building yeah. and say, can you please call this number? And yeah. tell them, I'm not paying. Whoever I call, is pay <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for this phone call. So she was complaining I was calling too much. You know, mm-hmm. um, I said, I don't need to talk to you. I need to talk to my dad. Can you please mm-hmm. give me? So to make the long story short, I, I put a lot of pressure on him, and he took me out mm. after uh, after 11 years. Mm. And uh, yeah. So if he hadn't done that, how long could that have gone on for? Who knows? I mean, <laughs> I hope they kick me out at some point. <laughs> I don't so, know. <laughs> so you didn't go to the trade school then? I did go to the trade school oh, in Crete. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, in Crete you did? Yeah, in Crete. Wow. Yeah. I went and I uh, learned an uh, 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 ele- electrician. Oh, okay. Which I did great in, 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 in theory, mm-hmm. but I suck in practice. Oh, <laughs> so you're able to do all the textbook work. All the textbook, all the, all the work, but uh, I worked like for three months um, uh, uh, putting like wires in buildings and, uh, and uh, it was to me was boring, you know, like, yeah. like breaking bricks and putting all the, the yeah. wires. Yeah, uh, it through. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. So you tried your hand at doing that work and then was well, there much gap between that moment and when you ended up in the merchant marines? No, not a lot of gap. Going to Sweden uh, after coming out of the Crete, uh, uh, of Crete, um, uh, going to, oh, going to the village of my stepmom, mm-hmm. um, spending um, two, three months there and then from there going to Sweden. Uh, uh, I had a hard time with the woman. She was really uh, with my stepmom. She was watching my every move. Like if I was eating, she would tell me to eat. I eat too fast, to slow down. Uh, uh, or if I was eating too much cheese, she would say that's too much cheese. Eat less. Always some critical thing, like too yeah. much or too little. Or and uh, so basically. Uh, I stayed three, four months in Sweden, and um, and then I said I can do 
I'm going to go back to Greece. So they shipped me back in Greece and reunited with some of my buddies from mm-hmm. Crete, uh, specifically with the two brothers, the two twins. And uh, I got a job. I rented out of I rented a room out of their uh, aunt. Mm-hmm. So I would we see each other every day. I would have my room. I did a lot of different works. I did like s- building skyfalls, scaffolds. Oh, okay. Which I was scared to death, but I needed the money. <laughs> it was very scary. Uh, I remember over four four. F- four-story building I would call sick I said <laughs> after four I can I cannot build any more sky holes. Uh you know walking like in a uh, yeah with nothing it's it's the road there it's, it's like the it bare was, minimum uh, yeah yeah so it was uh, so I but I did a few months I worked um, I unloaded trucks from the from the uh, from the uh, um, from the ships, you know, oh, uh, Thessaloniki. Yeah. It was the in docks, Thessaloniki. Yeah. yeah, from the docks and loaded trucks. I loaded trucks and lo- uh, I work all kinds of jobs. Um, and until I work in a restaurant as a, as a cook, as a waiter, until one day I find a friend from the orphanage who had returned from the ships, mm-hmm. merchant marines. And uh, he told me stories, and he told me countries, and uh, Singapore, and Brazil, and I thought, wow. And uh, so I got fascinated. So not long after that, I got um, uh, before that, I think I rented, at that time I rented with, I had left the the uh, the room I was trading. I was trading actually a whole apartment with three other guys, or so four of us, four bedrooms, four guys. Mm-hmm. And a lot of parties there, a lot of, eventually we burned the place up, kind of fire. Oh, no. And, <laughs> yeah. and uh, and we fixed it up. We pay some money to the landlady. Uh, we apologize, uh, but I knew then the time had come for me to yeah. to leave Greece altogether. <laughs> so I remember my friend. I w- I went and I got checked out. I got mm-hmm. a, a passport, mm-hmm. uh, not not regular passport, but uh, a sailor passport. Sailor's yeah. passport. Yeah. Wow. I went down to Athens. Mm-hmm. I went to Piraeus. And that's the biggest, the port, the biggest port, and start looking for job, start going to uh, shipping companies and asking, hey, do you have anything? No, you develop some friendships. Eventually, something opened up, and I found myself. After three months of looking, I found myself. Uh, uh, in Hamburg, Germany, my first, I flew, they flew me out of Athens yeah. to Germany, and that's where the five years, four and a half years started of exploring. Sailing the world. Sailing the world, yeah, yeah. And did you make it to Brazil? Made it to Brazil. Singapore? Not Singapore, but no. I made it to Taiwan, <laughs> I made it to Japan, I made it to Australia, I made it to other places. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And does that job give you the opportunity to to go to those places and truly explore? Or, yes, or, indeed. Yeah. I chose specifically cargo ships, not tankers, because mm-hmm. tankers are loading and uploading in a day, or mm. where cargo ships you can, depends the country, sometimes you can go for two weeks, sometimes three weeks. Nice. Uh, and sometimes two months, which depends uh, which country. Uh, Was the, there a country that you encountered that you were like, I could live here. This would work. Yeah, I think uh, I think United States was one. Yeah. Uh, uh, Germany was another one. Um, Belgium, mm-hmm. Belgium was another one. Uh, uh, Taiwan, Taiwan was another one. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, a lot of countries, you know. Yeah. But but it's different to visit and it's different to live because I came mm-hmm. here to live and I hate it. 
<laughs> the first two years, I want to go back. Uh, so visiting and living, they're two different things. What got you over the two-year hump? Um, I think I, I started speaking a little bit better English. Mm -hmm. and, um, and eventually, when my daughter was born, mm. that was it. Yeah. I'm not going anywhere. No, I'm it's time to, time to make the nest for the chick. Absolutely. So I have all the thinking of leaving, because I thought a few times to really, uh, to really go back home, home like I have home. <laughs> I'm yeah. homeless at heart. Uh, well, but that's a great question. So I, you think to yourself, I want to go back home. To what I know, to the culture. Yeah, okay. So to the, the Greek, Not anywhere home. in I didn't have a home. Yeah. I, I, uh, yeah, um, but something of that familiarity of the familiarity, Greek language, the language, the landscape, the yeah, everything, yeah. everything. How often yeah. do you get back there? Not very often. I went three, three times. One, mm. yeah, three times. I want to, I want to create a pilgrimage to not just Greece, but also southern Italy, where all those Greeks uh -huh. went and set up temples and their little palaces of learning that became what is Western civilization as we know it um, through their spiritual practices. Right. And uh, I just want to... So, anyway, I'm learning Italian right now. Are you? That's very cool. And yes. I think in a couple of years, my wife and I are going to go there and just rent a place for very nice. maybe three months or something like that and invite people to visit us and, uh, and try to get to know the area and and find a, and maybe a find that home um, feeling in, a, in yeah. a terms of a spiritual lineage. I felt it once when I was in Galilee. Mm. I, I, I woke up one morning and looked out at the hotel, you know, at, at the, uh, it's really a lake, uh, the Sea of Galilee, and just the way the 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 sun hit it and everything and I thought this is real wow. this is a real place uh -huh. everything we'd been to in the Holy Land looked very contrived and uh -huh. fake to me and but arbitrary that, but but that day just spoke to you Galilee just yeah. was like yeah that's a place where real people were and did uh. th did real things that meant something yeah to to us today. Right. And I think that could happen. I think I could maybe get that feeling in southern Italy or Greece yeah. um, and like Eleusis, uh, yeah. those places. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, for all I know today, I have lived here for so long now, mm -hmm. more years than I lived in Greece, that mm. this has become home now. This is home. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and when I say home, it's like culturally, right? Yeah. Because I think home is, I don't know what home is. Like if you tell me what is home, mm -hmm. most people say family, right? Or, mm -hmm. and I haven't figured that out yet because I'm still exploring it. I think it's something to do with where the roots are, like where the roots gather some sort of nourishment. That's sort of the home. And, uh, well, that's abstract, right? So concretely, I'll give you an example of when I felt it the most. I was sitting at a wedding, a wedding of a friend that I had known since I was probably four years old. Mm. And I'm looking around the room, and I was like, I know everybody in this room. I just yeah. know them. That's home, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I thought, at the time, I thought, well, my sister, who's about the same age as me, a little younger, you know, as soon as she graduated she to high school, she went to New York City and lived adventure, um, more or less. And she not made, whatever the roots were, they were torn up, right? And But I stayed here, and I've always kind of beat myself for that because I thought, oh, I should, I should do that too. I should get out. I should see the world more. And, but I stayed here, and I, and, and, uh, looked around that room at that wedding and I overwhelming gratitude for some reason came over me like mm. I have something is here yeah. I have that that my sister doesn't have I, and I don't know what that is 
that's a problem I have also that I've just accepted now, that in order for me to feel good about my portion in life, I have to find everyone else's uh, portion uh, Undesirable, right? Right. <laughs> right. So yeah. I just accept it now, and I'm like, "Oh, I'm so glad I'm not that person." Right. You know, they 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 suck. I'm better than them. Yeah. And um, and I no longer uh, feel guilty uh-huh. about that. I I go yeah. well as long as they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think home is relationship. Home is someone who sees views you as mm-hmm. as wants you like you're part of them like <laughs> and I discovered that once with my cousin my first cousin um, my favorite cousin uh, uh, Christina uh, who I remember I was in Greece one of my visits in my in Greece and um, I spent a lot of time with Christina and her husband and and um, when it was time for me to leave, it was nighttime, and her husband was taking me to the airport. Mm-hmm. She said something that really touched me and surprised me mm-hmm. and provoked such a emotional response from me. It came out of nowhere. Mm. And that's when I know it's real. Uh, she said, um, you know, you don't have a brother, and uh, and you know uh, I have one brother. But you know you and I can we you know you and I will become brothers. Mm. So she she told me while I was having my luggage and I was going down and a hiker. And by the time I went into the car, extreme pressure, like. Emotionally, the pressure in my, it came from my body, I think, to my head. Um, hmm. As soon as I sat in the seat in the car, I, her husband, Yorgos, was here, and I started bursting crying. Mm-hmm. Like, not really crying, sobbing. Yeah. That I don't remember I ever sobbed. Mm-hmm. And he got, he didn't know what was going on with me. <laughs> And eventually I told him right, uh, that it felt like someone was seeing me, someone wanted to be mm-hmm. like, although cousins, first cousins are, you know, kind, but she wanted to be like a brother and a sister. And it's like, like someone who loves you, right? I never mm-hmm. felt that. Wow. Uh, and, and, uh, and that, my reaction opened him up. Like my mm. vulnerability, and then he said, so we became closer because someone really was emotionally vulnerable to a point where, and it's hard not to be vulnerable if someone does that. I mean, right. it feels uncomfortable to yeah. speak as you speak like every day. It's just, mm-hmm. it feels weird yeah. to them probably. So mm-hmm. he opened up. But, but I know home is that. Home is mm-hmm. someone who really, and it's not a thing, it's not necessarily a romantic relationship, or it can be a thing, and hmm. it, it, it doesn't even, it doesn't even need to be a family mm-hmm. member. It can be really something, but it has to be something there. Uh, it has to come from me. Mm-hmm. People doesn't have to tell, like people can tell me, but Eventually, it's me who have reaction or not reaction to it. Right? right. So, in that particular case, I knew. I knew in my gut, I always felt loved by mm-hmm. Christina, and when Christina said that, it really connected with me, and mm-hmm. then I had that reaction. I felt that felt home. Wow. That felt oh, <laughs> that's home. That's what home is. It's beautiful. Yeah. So we're not going to have any better conversation after that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you yeah, for thanks. telling us. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. It was really great uh, opening up. Yeah.
Thank you. So that was Sturgios. Pretty amazing guy. I feel really lucky. Our paths crossed. He's uh, part of my personal growth and has contributed so much to the folks that have come through the lens. And once again, we've got a bunch of retreats coming up. One in uh, the spring of 2022, another one in the fall of 2022. So if what we're doing at these retreats sounds like anything you'd be interested in doing, we'll have flyers up with some information, a little bit about the agenda the different course tracks, different offerings, different kinds of experiences you can have at this retreat. So yeah, um, check it out, see if it's something you'd be into, and I'd love to sign you up and get you on the roster for the next retreat. Well, thanks so much for tuning in, and appreciate you listening, appreciate your interest in the lens. If you're trying to unfold the fullness of your capacities back into this universe, I'd love to talk to you show you what's on offer here at the lens and wouldn't mind having you as a guest on the show too why are you stopped